Okay, so good morning. My name is Mustafa Falapsi. I am a professor here at the University of Minnesota, and I welcome you to the monthly, monthly webinar of the University of Minnesota Medical School, uh, Duluth Global Health Research. Uh, the webinar is conducted in collaboration with the Africa and Middle East Congress on Addiction. I'm so happy to have many of you attending this webinar uh, from various uh, countries and continents around the world. And then thank you for the many comments and positive feedback we have received in recent uh, weeks and months as the webinar series continues. So please uh, keep your feedback and suggestions coming. Um, as you know, and if this is your first time, please be aware that you should be able to provide comments and ask questions using the functions in the bottom of uh, your screen of the uh, Zoom platform. And uh, feel free to jot your, down your notes and questions as we go. The theme for today is the global condition of uh, stimulant use and abuse, and uh, we are very happy to have with us today uh, a well-known global expert in this field, Dr. Uh, Richard Rosen. Let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Rosen. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA Department of Psychiatry, and a research professor at the Vermont Center for Behavior and Health at the University of uh, Vermont. He is a world-renowned expert in stimulant disorder and clinical trials for these disorders. Uh, Dr. Rosen conducted numerous clinical trials on pharmacological and psychosocial behavioral addiction treatments for the treatment of individuals with cocaine and methamphetamine disorders. Uh, he has led addiction research and training projects for the United Nations and the U.S. State Department, exporting science-based knowledge to many parts of the world. He's currently working in California to develop knowledge and interventions to address the need for uh, healthcare professionals, the, need of, the needs of healthcare professionals working with individuals who use uh, stimulants. And he's working with seven other states to help develop evidence-based treatment for stimulant use disorders. Dr. Rosen has published three books, uh, 40 book chapters, and over 250 peer-reviewed articles and has conducted over 1,000 workshops, paper presentations, and training sessions. We're so honored to have him with us today delivering our monthly webinar for the month of May. So without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Razan to share with us his uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, after the introduction, I feel like we should just say very good, have a good day, and goodbye. Um, but uh, I will give you a uh, an overview today of uh, the current knowledge we have on uh, psychostimulants. Um, I spent most of my career working with uh, individuals who used cocaine and methamphetamine. Uh, in Los Angeles and around uh, the United States and other parts of the world. Uh, I, in 2015, I left UCLA and living in Los Angeles to move back to my original home in Vermont. Um, and at that time, it was the peak of the opioid uh, crisis in the United States. And I didn't think I'd ever be doing a lot more work on stimulants, but um, the stimulant problem in the United States and worldwide is uh, expanding. And in the time I have today, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of um, 
some of the current knowledge we have on stimulants and, and treatment of people with stimulant use disorders, I've um, predictably have packed way too many slides into this presentation. So this is going to be a very quick overview of a lot of information. My email is at the end, and I'm very happy to answer email questions um, and have discussion after the session. Unfortunately, right at the end of this session, I have to go to another Zoom session, so I won't be able to stay on at the end of the time. But please uh, send me uh, uh, emails with in questions and queries if you have any uh, questions on any of the detail. I will start with a quick overview from the uh, UNODCP 2020 World Drug Report, their report on stimulants. First off, when we say psychostimulants, we mean different things in different parts of the world. Um, and this gives you the breakdown that the uh, World Drug Report has with Africa, where cocaine and methamphetamine, and they probably should have cot on here as well, uh, North America, we have that range of uh, stimulants. And you can see in, in Latin America, it's primarily cocaine and, and the like. It's different in different parts of the world. In the Middle East, uh, where I've done uh, a good deal of work in your area, um, Captagon was the uh, predominant stimulant, although my understanding was that it was an amphetamine that it wasn't the old actual drug captagon. It's now captagon, but it's really methamphetamine. And you see the rest. Some parts of the world cocaine, some parts of the world methamphetamine, ecstasy, and a few, a few parts as well. Uh, just in general, to give you some idea of the uh, amount, you see cannabis is, is the drug that's seized most often in the world, but cocaine and methamphetamine are second and fourth in terms of the quantities that are seized. So these are both drugs that are seized in large amounts in, in seizures by uh, law enforcement. As you can see, in the last six years, there's been a sharp increase in the amount of coca cultivation in cocaine manufacture. And uh, we've seen uh, similar uh, uh, increases in terms of uh, methamphetamine. This, this breaks down the different categories of stimulants of methamphetamine, what are generally referred to as ATS, amphetamine type stimulants. Methamphetamine is the most widely uh, produced and we see that in a, in a variety of different areas of the world. Here in North America, it's now predominantly ma manufactured in Mexico and controlled by the cartels. Um, Southeast Asia, there's factories in Myanmar and uh, purportedly North Korea and in, in Asia. Um, in the Middle East, uh, there's, a, there's a good deal of methamphetamine manufactured in Syria and Iran. And so we have, this, this is the big one that gets, um, and a lot of it gets stamped into other forms. There are tablet forms, this captagon, which I think is a, a tablet form of methamphetamine. So you see it in different parts of the world, but the thing that's, con that, that, that's clear is the amount that is being seized is going up just as with cocaine. So we're likely to continue to see this as a drug that's on the, on the market and is affecting the patients who seek treatment. Um, this is just, uh, Captagon has predominantly been in, the, in Saudi Arabia is where I uh, generally uh, talk to clinicians about it. But yeah, as you can see, also in Jordan and Syria and some of the uh, UAE countries. Um, but I, I think when you analyze the, the actual drug, it's, it's uh, meth some form of methamphetamine. Ecstasy is in, uh, the seizures are in, in these countries um, and ecstasy is manufactured predominantly in Netherlands. Uh, so this gives you a very quick snapshot of the situation. In general, the, the short uh, story is increased production of cocaine in uh, Colombia, increased production of methamphetamine all over the world. And so we're likely to see these, these stimulants and others like ecstasy continue to create significant public health uh, problems. Here in the US, just to give you an overview of our current situation here in the United States, this is our, the, the, the best way we now track 
the severity of our substance use disorder uh, problems. Unfortunately, the, the one that is, is now has the most attention is overdose deaths. Uh, that, this was not true during much of my career. During the first 20 years of my career, 25 years of my career, we had all sorts of surveys and all kinds of things that we used to measure uh, different drug problems. In the last 15 years, really, the, the, the major index we use is how many people die from overdose. As you can see on this slide, the gold line uh, gradually increasing across the first part of the 2000, the decade of the 2000s, was prescription opioids. In the United States, our, our major drug epidemic we're having right now was started with prescription opioids, tablets, painkillers that were um, prescribed and made their way onto the street. And that really generated um, our, our, the initial part of our opioid crisis. Beginning at about 2010, the green line you see going up is heroin overdoses. Um, as, they, as the um, pr prescription opioid supply started to level off and actually decrease, heroin came in to backfill in the market. And so we ended up seeing uh, for a period of about five years, heroin was a major factor in driving the uh, overdose death problem in the US. But starting in about 2014, two things took off. One was fentanyl, the red line. The red line are fentanyl deaths. Now fentanyl is a, a, a powerful pain uh, analgesic. Um, in my earlier career, we never saw fentanyl on the street. Fentanyl was a, a medicine that was only used by anesthesiologists in very limited medical settings, but over, um, you know, the last 15 years, fentanyl, both in its pharmaceutical form and much more now in its uh, illicit manufacture, we're seeing lots of fentanyl on the street. And it's mind boggling to me that this drug that is so lethal is now commonly mixed into a lot of the drugs on the street. I just had a call with a group from West Virginia uh, uh, before this call. And they see fentanyl in all the drugs of their cannabis, uh, heroin, methamphetamine, even now mixed with benzodiazepines. So they see it in these Xanax tablets that are being sold. So fentanyl has made its way into all of the drug supply. The other line you see there that goes up in terms of overdose deaths is stimulants. Um, stimulants, the combination of cocaine and methamphetamine now are the second killer in the United States in our drug scene. This was really unheard of in most of my career. I gave talks around cocaine and methamphetamine for literally decades from up until about five years ago. I was doing talks on those drugs and would rarely mention overdose deaths. Now we, we, it's a major issue. It's the major driver of concern about uh, stimulant use in the US is that it's creating so many deaths from um, overdose related to stimulants, which some of which include fentanyl. Most of the cocaine supply now has fentanyl in it. A little bit from 2012 to 2018 in the United States, cocaine related deaths more than tripled. Uh, methamphetamine related deaths increased fivefold. And uh, so this gives you some idea of what that looks like. Um, with, at, at the present time, almost equivalent number of deaths from cocaine and from methamphetamine in the United States. Uh, and I think in the last two years, those lines converge so that they're almost the same at this point. The rate of deaths from methamphetamine has been increasing. Cocaine is sort of leveled off and most of the cocaine deaths are actually caused by fentanyl. Um, fentanyl is, um, is showing up in, as I mentioned, in all the drugs. Um, this is, uh, gives you some idea of the potency of fentanyl. This is uh, a lethal dose of heroin. This, the amount of heroin you see in the small vial would be enough to kill a person. The lethal dose of fentanyl is in the right-hand bottle. So you see, it's just a matter of grains. It's not a, a very much a volume at all. So you can mix small amounts of this drug into 
the heroin supply, the methamphetamine supply, the cocaine supply, and it makes all of those drugs incredibly lethal and deadly. Uh, that's part of what's driving this uh, overdose death crisis in the US. We're also seeing huge amounts of methamphetamine being seized. Uh, here is a, a ton that was seized on the uh, Mexican border uh, last fall. And much of this, the, and the, the newer methamphetamine we're seeing, when I was seeing lots of patients back in the 1990s and early 2000s, they were using methamphetamine that was in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 to 50 percent pure. If you look 2016, 2018, the drug now is almost uh, 100 percent pure. This results in the methamphetamine itself being more lethal. And so not only are we seeing deaths from stimulants because they have fentanyl mixed in, but the stimulants themselves, at least in the case of methamphetamine, are more lethal in and of themselves. And we're seeing a lot more medical deaths related to use of methamphetamine. The other factor, of course, that you've all experienced is the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. Um, the death rate in the US uh, has uh, increased dramatically in the last uh, uh, 15 months since the uh, COVID epidemic. These are deaths from August of 2019 to August of 2020. And the number of deaths is 88,000 deaths. I believe I heard a rec more recent report through the end of the year, which suggested that the number of deaths in 2020 will be about 95,000. Now that's in comparison to 2019, where the number, which was an all time high, was about 70,000. So the number has jumped in, depending on where you look in the United States, about 25% increase in the death rate. And much of that has are, have been deaths associated with stimulants. This just is a graphic you can see way over there, January of 2020, it's relatively flat until it hits about March and then it just spikes up uh, with an increase. So the pandemic, I would suspect this is true worldwide, although I haven't seen worldwide data on this, I would suspect that overdose deaths uh, around the world are increased. They certainly have in the United States. Okay, here's a very quick overview of the impacts of uh, methamphetamine. Martin Paulus, my colleague from uh, University of California at San Diego and his colleague, uh, Dr. Stewart, published this review uh, about a year ago in JAMA. It's a great review. It is, uh, gives a very current update, particularly of the neurobiology. Um, they discuss the neurotoxicity and effects on uh, the cognitive uh, process, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular symptoms. And that's a very new, as I mentioned, we're seeing a lot more deaths from methamphetamine. And for the most part, it comes from either heart-related uh, heart problems or stroke-related problems. And um, there's a need for pharmacologic interventions, and I'll talk about that very briefly uh, later on in the talk. The neurotoxicity, I think the important thing to take away from sort of the big picture message from Martin's uh, paper is the overall, the altered brain state of, of a an individual who's been chronically using methamphetamine is consistent with degenerative central nervous system diseases. That is, people who have chronically used methamphetamine and to a lesser degree cocaine, but here I'm going to talk primarily about methamphetamine uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, what we're dealing with is, is a drug that damages the brain. When the individual who has been chronically using enters treatment, we don't talk to them as if they had a brain disease. We talk to them as if they have traumatic brain damage. They're the, their, their brain has been affected by their use of methamphetamine and you see significant damage. One of the easiest ways that you see the effects of uh, the methamphetamine affects these neurotransmitters and others. We talk mainly about its effect on dopamine vis-a-vis -vis addiction, but it does affect norepinephrine and, and serotonin as well. One of the easiest ways or most, most 
uh, obvious ways of measuring the effects of methamphetamine are the effects on cognition. This gives you a real clear picture that this drug has changed the way the brain operates. After, soon after cessation of methamphetamine use, we've had lots of studies done on the effects of um, the chronic meth use on poor performance in motor and, and other processing tasks and verbal fluency and attention tasks. The person really isn't able to track very well. Um, you also see uh, significant effects on memory and on uh, working memory and on uh, long-term memory. And even after prolonged abstinence, you see some measurable effects on cognitive processes. Uh, and so when you're dealing with these folks who have been using heavy amounts of methamphetamine, um, they're coming in with, with very limited or very uh, disrupted cognitive functioning based on the effects of the drug on the brain. It's estimated more than two thirds of those with methamphetamine use disorder show significant cognitive impairment. The impairment tends to be greater with older users, those who have used longer, those who have injected the drug, and those who have used more frequently. So if you're seeing someone who has been using every day, they've been injecting every day, they've been using for 10 years, and they're now 45 years old, they're very likely to have significant amount of uh, cognitive damage. Now, we think that most of that damage recovers over time with abstinence from um, methamphetamine, but there's clearly cases where it doesn't recover, there, where there are people who suffer what appears to be permanent brain damage as a result of their uh, chronic methamphetamine use. And you have to remember, if you're using treatments, behavioral and cognitive behavioral treatments, a lot of what the individual hears they don't retain. So you often, if you're going to use those kind of treatments, you have to be very um, focused with what you're telling them, give it to them in short pieces of information and repeat it uh, quite often because their retention is not good. Now, this is something I never talked about in during my earlier year talks around uh, methamphetamine is that um, the leading cause of of death, cerebrovascular uh, stroke is the leading cause of death with people with methamphetamine use disorder. There have been a number of studies showing strokes are on the rise. Um, the studies have been with young men, although the strokes aren't limited to young men. We, we see it with men and women, but I think the important word is young. It's no longer where we only see people in their 60s and 70s having strokes. We're seeing people now in their 30s and 40s. Uh, the strokes are primarily hemorrhagic, that is blood vessel bursting in the brain, although we do see ischemic strokes as well, where the blood vessel is blocked or constricted and blood supply doesn't get to the brain. So the methamphetamine in its current form, where it's very pure and very potent, uh, produces these brain effects that we, we never saw in the old days when we were seeing uh, people using much lower uh, uh, potency uh, methamphetamine. We also see a variety of, of cardiovascular disorders, pulmonary hypertension, arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy. Um, you're seeing uh, for the, because we're seeing an increasing rate of injection, we're seeing many more cases of endocarditis of people being in um, uh, treatment needing heart valve replacements because of endocarditis. This is a study out of uh, um, uh, Australia on stroke among methamphetamine use in young adults. 77 articles they review um, with hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes. Um, a third of those with hemorrhagic strokes died, 20% uh, with ischemic strokes died. So you tend to see um, the uh, different type of stroke from related to the different route of administration. Hemorrhagic strokes predominate for people who inject ischemic strokes for people who inhale or smoke uh, uh, stimulants. Either way, a very dangerous effect on the brain. 
Uh, there, this study uh, published in 2019 uh, re uh, reviewed the issue of stimulants uh, among um, stimulant use among pregnant women. Now, here in the United States, in the last uh, 20 years, over the period of our opioid crisis, uh, we've seen tremendous advances in treating uh, pregnant women who use opioids. Uh, the use of medications, methadone and buprenorphine, have really uh, done a tremendous service in helping us work with pregnant women addicted to opioids. Unfortunately, we have no medications for women who use stimulants and or for anybody else for that matter. And there are uh, data that stimulant use during pregnancy produces substantial risk to both the mother and to the fetus. Um, we often see in samples of patient populations using stimulants, almost a 50-50 breakdown of uh, them being men and women, about half males, half females, at least here in the United States. And it's, um, that's relatively unusual in, in the old days of when I was seeing lots of heroin users in before 2000, it was always 60% male, 65% male, 30, 30, 35% female. I think that's somewhat become more equal with prescription opioids. But if with stimulants, just from the first studies we did in the, in the 80s and 90s, was almost equal, 50-50. Um, so you see a, a lot more women uh, using these drugs, of course, a lot more pregnant women. And um, we're now seeing more reports and some of the data, some preliminary data of prenatal stimulant use is more common than opioid use. This article reviewed a meta-analysis uh, that was done in 2011 of 31 studies of cocaine use during pregnancy. And the meta-analysis conclusions were that uh, cocaine use during pregnancy increased the risk of preterm delivery, low birth weight, small for gestational age, earlier gestational age at delivery, and reduced birth weight. I think I said that twice. Um, meta-analysis of eight studies of methamphetamine use during pregnancy indicated earlier gestational age at delivery, lower birth weight, smaller head circumference. Um, individuals with prenatal exposure to methamphetamine exhibit a more robust withdrawal syndrome when uh, after delivery with jitteriness, drowsiness, and respiratory distress um, suggesting withdrawal symptoms from methamphetamine. Of course, if the mother continues to use cocaine or methamphetamine, uh, both of which are exc excreted in breast milk, breastfeeding is contraindicated. So uh, that is another danger for the, uh, the child uh, if the mother continues to use. This review, this, uh, this uh, Schmidt paper also reviewed a study that I was involved with, Chris DeRoff's study in 2007, where we followed 204 methamphetamine exposed uh, children uh, and compared them to 208 controls. Uh, we looked at them at three years, and there was testing done of these kids. At three years, heavy prenatal methamphetamine exposure uh, was associated with elevated levels of anxiety, depression, and attention. And at seven and a half years, the methamphetamine exposed kids had poorer cognitive function on a variety of measures. Uh, our group at UCLA did a study and tested four-year-olds, um, and we found a particular deficit in language learning. That is, their, their vocabularies were um, more, um, uh, were less rich, and they seemed to have more trouble learning uh, new words. And that was seemed to be pretty specific to verbal learning. So clearly, the use of these stimulant drugs by pregnant women does have an effect on the, um, on the fetus and getting the, uh, these folks into treatment is uh, a real priority. However, we don't have anything nearly as effective as buprenorphine and methadone to pull them into treatment and keep them in treatment during pregnancy. Uh, there's been a number of studies on dental effects. Um, certainly uh, people who use any illicit drugs 
have lots of dental problems, but with methamphetamine, they tend to be particularly severe in part because um, methamphetamine drives, dries up uh, saliva production and the users tend to uh, grind their teeth, have bruxism. And actually when they inhale the vapor, if they're smoking it, there's an acidic content to the smoke that causes or appears to cause damage to uh, the teeth. So they, it, it's a whole variety of things. Plus they, they eat lots, eat and drink lots of uh, unhealthy things and don't have good oral hygiene. So there's it, many of the chronic ind individuals who have chronically used methamphetamine when they come into treatment, in addition to all their other problems, they have severe dental issues and often dental pain, which can be a, a route back to drug use if they are given if they're given painkillers. Um, so the dental issues also have to be addressed as part of their treatment, and they often have significant dermatologic effects. Uh, chronic individuals who've chronically been using cocaine or methamphetamine often start to scratch their skin. They get um, dilation on their skin uh, and it feels tingly and they'll, when they're experiencing psychosis from their drug use, they'll often scratch themselves and develop uh, significant scarring. Plus if they've been injected, they get cellulitis and other injection site uh, dermatologic effects. So there's a whole range of medical issues uh, around the use of people with stimulant use uh, disorder. When I used to run clinics in the 1980s and 90s and early 2000s for treating people with stimulant use disorder, we had a very minimal medical component to our treatment. If I was setting up clinics today to treat people with methamphetamine and cocaine use disorder, I would want there to be a robust medical component because these folks come into treatment now with uh, very significant medical uh, complications that need to be addressed as part of their treatment. In addition to psychiatric complications, they have uh, a range of very significant medical issues. Here's some of the clinical challenges in trying to treat patients with this disorder. I mentioned overdose death. Um, I'm gonna show you some data on the difficulty of getting people into treatment. Um, and that's partly a function of the fact that many individuals who use stimulants don't see themselves as having a problem. They, they point to their opioid using colleagues and say, well, they're addicted because they have to use every day. They can't not use, but I can stop when I want to. So I'm not addicted. So they have that kind of misperception of the seriousness of their problem, which leads contributes to having ambivalence about whether or not they need to stop using. Uh, part because of the effects of the drug on the brain and on the prefrontal cortex, they have impulsivity and poor judgment. As I mentioned, cognitive impairment and memory problems. The hallmark of stimulant recovery is anhedonia, which is the inability to experience pleasure. They have a blunted pleasure response. Life doesn't feel enjoyable for the first three, four months. This is uh, it's a fairly long thing. And this is often one of the big challenges of, in dealing with uh, relapse and helping people stop use is this feeling of, I can't live the rest of my life feeling like this. And so I'm just gonna have to keep using because life isn't worth living. Stimulants, particularly methamphetamine, produce paranoia. They produce psychosis as well. Um, but even those who aren't, aren't actively psychotic will have a low-grade paranoia, which also interferes with engaging them in treatment. Um, during their use, they're hypersexual. Often when they stop using, they become hyposexual or not able to function sexually, which becomes a big issue in treatment. Uh, the, the, the real crux of their use, loss of control, is this Pavlovian triggering response where stimuli, things that are people, places, things, times of day, emotional states that are associated with their use now will stimulate craving. And they don't understand that. Cash, 
is for almost all of them a trigger. If you have somebody who's in early recovery from methamphetamine and you give them a $20 bill, they'll get a physical reaction to it. They will talk about how it causes them to start thinking about, I, I need to go and use. They don't understand what that is. Part of treatment is explaining that Pavlovian um, response. They have elevated rates of psychiatric comorbidity and they're very difficult to retain in treatment. This is some data from a syringe exchange program in Washington state, uh, 600, 500, 583 participants. About two thirds were individuals who used opioids. One third were individuals who used methamphetamine. They did a bunch of surveys with these folks who were in the syringe exchange and 82% of the individuals who used opioids said that they recognized at some point in the future, not now, but sometime in the future, they were going to need to reduce their use or stop their use or get into treatment. So four out of five recognized their use was a problem that eventually they were gonna to have to deal with. Less than half of those who used methamphetamine felt that way. They just didn't see their use as a problem. They were going to the syringe exchange, getting their uh, new syringes, but when asked if they thought they would ever need to reduce their use or get into treatment, less than half said they would. That reflects our challenge in getting these folks into treatment. Um, this is the other part of that. The other part of this, this was published last year, a review of dropout rates from psychosocial treatments. Um, a meta-analysis of 151 studies. They looked at dropout in the first 90 days of treatment, and they looked at it by type of drug used, and they had some other stuff in there, but th what I found interesting was this. For the individuals who used heroin, they, they reported a 25% dropout in the first 90 days, and that, um, of course, people with heroin use disorder have buprenorphine and methadone available to them. So they have very effective medications that when they take the medication it makes them feel better, they're able to function, they're able to uh, do well. So there's a relatively low dropout rate in the first 90 days. Tobacco, it's about the same. Alcohol is about the same, about 25, 26%. With cocaine, it's almost double that to 48%. With methamphetamine, it's more than double to 53%. So you have a, the stim, People with stimulant use disorders are harder to get into treatment and harder to keep in treatment. Now, that's not simply a function of their disorder. It's a function also of what treatment is available. Um, if somebody who has a, an opioid problem is asked if they need treatment or if they want to, they know now, or there's certainly increasing information that they can go into treatment and get a medication that's going to help them feel better and help them function. Individuals for cocaine and methamphetamine, when you talk to them about treatment, it's, well, you can go into someplace and somebody will talk to you. Not, not quite as appealing a, uh, a treatment uh, a benefit. So part of our challenge right now is finding ways to make treatment more attractive and to hold treat people in treatment, retain them. This shows that this stimulant issue is not just a problem for our people only using stimulants, but also for the patients we have in treatment for opioid use disorder. As I said, in the US, there's been a tremendous improvement in the, the, the availability of buprenorphine for the treatment of opioid use disorder. This study from uh, Washington State of 800 new admissions into treatment, when they interviewed them at admission, two thirds of them 70% of them were just using opioids. 30% of them were using opioids and methamphetamine at the time of admission. And these are their retention rates. The top line are the opioid only users. The bottom line are those that were also using methamphetamine. So you can see that in the first 100 days, the individuals who are also using methamphetamine drop out of treatment very quickly. Now, in all candor, probably many of those 100-day dropouts were people who were not just dropping out, but were actually kicked out of treatment 
because in the early days for many of our new prescribers, if a patient was continuing to use methamphetamine, they felt they shouldn't prescribe to them, they shouldn't prescribe buprenorphine. I think that practice is changing dramatically in the US um, and certainly should change. There, there's no, not a justifiable reason to kick people off from medication for some other drug use. And so hopefully that's changing, but you can see that if you came into treatment for your opioid use disorder and you are also using methamphetamine, your retention was much poorer. These are some of the patient populations that are much more challenging. The top two are really the ones who in all the studies that I've been involved with do the poorest in treatment, the injectors and those who use in very, uh, a lot of days. You say in the last 30 days, how many days have you used? If they say 29 or 30 days, that person's likely to have a much tougher job in, in terms of treatment, as well as the injectors. And some other categories in the last one, as I just mentioned, individuals in medication treatment for opioid use disorder uh, have a particular challenge in treatment. Our harm reduction strategies for people with stimulant use disorder are not very well developed. Um, right now, about all we do is provide, well, syringe exchange, which is great for those who inject. Uh, we're educating about fentanyl so that we can, if people think of themselves as stimulant, individuals who use stimulants, um, they need to know that their stimulant may have fentanyl in it and how dangerous fentanyl is. I think we're starting to do more in terms of outreach with naloxone because if they're using stimulants, if they're using cocaine and the cocaine supply all has fentanyl in it, then when they overdose, naloxone will, can be useful in reversing the fentanyl overdose, even though it doesn't help with the cocaine overdose, if that's what it is. And then there's some other modest things that we do. I think harm reduction for this uh, population who use stimulants really needs to be more well-developed in, in the US. Okay, what do we know about treatment for people with stimulant use disorder? Now, in the old days, I would start showing you slides with data on it right about now and talking about, this is what this study showed, this is what this study showed. Well, fortunately, in the last uh, three years, we've had uh, seven meta-analyses of the data on treatment for people with stimulant use disorder. So I don't have to go through study by study. I'll, I'll show you a few of these meta-analyses. This was a group in Oxford that, uh, in the WHO that uh, published on the comparative efficacy and acceptability of psychosocial interventions for individuals with cocaine and amphetamine addiction. And they reviewed uh, 50 studies with 7,000 participants 12 different psychosocial interventions for cocaine and amphetamine addiction. And for those of you who are researchers, and I think there's quite a few of you who are, I don't know if your experience is like mine, but my, my experience of reading meta-analyses usually is that things, eh, they don't really work very well. Some things work for some people and there's questions about these effects and some of them are modest effects. Not true here. The results were very uh, robust. The combination of contingency management and the community reinforcement approach was the most efficacious and most acceptable treatment, both in the short and the long term. Uh, Mike Farrell and his uh, group uh, published an article in The Lancet. This was not a review, a systematic review, but he reviewed, it's a great paper published a couple of years ago now, uh, looked at the global stimulant uh, situation and his short section on treatment, this was his statement on treatment. Psychosocial interventions other than contingency management have weak and nonspecific effects on stimulant problems and there are no effective pharmacotherapies. So according to their group's review of the literature, uh, contingency management was the only thing that worked. This was a study from last summer uh, published in Drug and Alcohol Dependence. They reviewed 44 studies, non-pharmacologic interventions for methamphetamine use disorder. They found that while contingency management interventions showed the strongest evidence favoring outcomes, 
Uh, there was some evidence for cognitive behavioral therapy alone or with contingency management. And there are three other meta-analyses that I'm not reporting on, one that just came out about a month ago um, and published in JAMA uh, that said contingency management is the only evidence-based uh, uh, treatment for people with stimulant use disorder. There's a similar one by a group in Canada. Um, so the data have just been overwhelming, supporting the use of contingency management. This group published last fall a study on contingency management treatment of methamphetamine use disorder. They reviewed 27 studies and looked at a variety of outcomes and found that in 26 of the 27 studies, the group treated with contingency management reduced their methamphetamine use compared to a control. They were retained in treatment longer than a control. They attended more therapy sessions, higher use of other services, reductions in sexual and risky sexual behavior, increases in positive affect, decreases in negative affect. So when you use contingency management, it doesn't just reduce the drug use, it does that very effectively, but you also get other benefits as well. And uh, so it is a treatment that although it's a relatively straightforward treatment designed to reduce drug use, when you reduce that drug use, other positive stuff happens as well. For those of you not familiar with contingency management, I won't go into uh, detail today, but I will give you a quick uh, definition. It's a technique involving the systematic delivery of positive reinforcement for desired behaviors. And those desired behaviors are behaviors that indicate a reduction in drug use or some positive recovery behavior like attending treatment. Uh, many of the studies have uh, with uh, people with methamphetamine dependence, if you come in and give a drug-free urine, a, a urine sample that has no stimulants in it, you earn, you can earn a gift card for $10. Or if you do three in a row, you get a bonus of $20, a gift card. We generally don't use cash, but uh, they earn uh, vouchers. They get a voucher that they can cash in for money, or they get prizes that are um, part of a, a, a process they can use a technique called the fishbowl method, where it's almost a lottery that they win either small prizes or large prizes. And anyway, the, the basic idea is you're providing an incentive for these behaviors that indicate a reduction in stimulant use. Uh, and this is the technique that I just referred to in those other studies that shows a huge positive benefit to the, to the patients. Um, no question this technique works. However, it's relatively modestly used anywhere in the world. It's one of those cases where we have a technique that works, but it hasn't made its way into application. Here in the United States, it's used in the Veterans Administration system. Um, Dr. Nancy Petrie, who was the University of Connecticut professor and her colleagues did a great job of getting it adopted by the VA. So it, it, contingency management is now the treatment of choice for people with stimulant use disorder if you're a veteran in the veterans hospital system. Uh, but in the rest of the United States, it's used almost not at all. There's a whole issue of getting insurance coverage for that and all of those things, but I won't go into that in detail. But certainly if you wanted to pick the treatment that has by far the best evidence, contingency management, Pretty much everybody agrees. There's not much debate about this. This is the technique that uh, has all of the support. Now, I did a study before I left UCLA. It was my last big NIDA project on exercise. Um, I won't go through the, the, the data, but I think this is an area that's gonna show increasing application in the real world treatment system. Our study was, um, a study of people in a residential setting. They were in a long-term residential setting. Half of them got exercise in addition to their normal treatment. Half of them got a control. They went to a class. Eight weeks, 24 sessions, and then we collected a whole ton of data on them. What we found was that those who got exercise, and I published a number of studies, be happy to send them to you, um, 
obviously we're in better, better physical condition at the end of the exercise eight week period, had less weight gain, uh, better cardiovascular functioning, that is they had increased heart rate variability, reduced symptoms of anxiety, depression, reduced craving. Uh, we did PET scans pre post. We found that um, those who were, got exercise showed more recovery in the dopamine system than the control condition. And when we followed them into the community, when they were discharged from treatment, we saw less relapse in the exercise condition, except for those people that were in the very heavy, heaviest user category. We had the category stratified. Um, the people who had the heaviest users, the injection users and the daily users, we didn't see much effective exercise, but in everybody else we did. And uh, I think we've published now our ninth paper out of this study, very, uh, I think a very underused strategy, but um, one that has, I think, great potential. So if you look at the overall um, review of, of the different treatments, Contingency management clearly has the most robust evidence. There is some evidence for cognitive behavioral therapy and community reinforcement approach. There were a few studies done with cocaine, individuals who used cocaine, which showed some benefits from motivational interviewing, but uh, even in the absence of uh, lots of studies on motivational interviewing, Motivational interviewing is particularly useful in dealing with individuals who are ambivalent about whether they need to get treatment or not, or stay in treatment. I think motivational interviewing is a skill that's essential to being able to work with uh, people who have stimulant use disorder. And I would argue that we're starting to develop an, an evidence base around physical exercise. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. Medications. Um, for cocaine use disorder, first off, for, for stimulant use disorder, cocaine and methamphetamine, there are no FDA approved medicines. Um, so we currently have no medicine that we can point to as being like our buprenorphine or methadone for stimulants. Um, we've been looking for, um, uh, for 40 years, uh, Research on this has been going on. I actually looked up, uh, I noticed on my, my own CV, my first study was published in 1981 on uh, using, looking at imipramine, which is an old tricyclic uh, antidepressant. We looked at imipramine with methamphetamine using individuals, um, didn't work. I actually had a pretty big career of uh, doing studies that didn't work. So. Um, but there are some medications that seem to have some positive uh, findings for cocaine use disorder, topiramate, modafinil, and bupropion, uh, and amphetamine itself, uh, amphetamine salts. There are a number of studies that have positive findings, nothing yet that's been an overwhelmingly robust positive finding so that it could go to the FDA for, for approval. But these are some of the things currently being researched in addition to um, vaccines. It's remarkable, the vaccine research has been going on now for a while. Uh, when COVID hit and we developed a vaccine in less than a year, um, it, was, it was an amazingly impressive accomplishment because the vaccine development thing here has been going on for quite some time. And I don't think we're even close yet on a vaccine. For methamphetamine use disorder, uh, there's a couple of things that appear to be, have the best evidence. Uh, mirtazapine, which is an antidepressant, an SSRI. Well, it's a mixed SSRI, something else. Um, there have been two studies, both double blind placebo controlled, who have shown uh, positive findings for the treatment of methamphetamine use disorder. And about two months ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine, a bupropion naltrexone study, extended release naltrexone um, was published. It was done in the Clinical Trials Network, um, published and showed the combination of bupropion plus extended release naltrexone uh, had a signal. Had a, the signal was relatively modest, and the PI, Dr. Trudy, was very candid about the fact that, yes, this is a positive finding, but 
it's not as though most of the patients responded. Uh, the response rate was about one in eight who had a positive response to bupropion naltrexone. Although it was one in eight, it was zero in eight in the placebo group. So there was a, a positive effect, but I think it's a signal that we might be looking at some things that may work, but at the current time, we don't have a medicine that we can look to for the treatment of stimulant use disorder. Um, my colleagues and I have been asked by a number of states to help them develop treatment. We've recommended contingency management, but for a whole variety of regulatory things, you can't use contingency management today. We've put together a set of materials that we think combine some incentive use. You can use $75, which isn't enough to do contingency management, but it's something, along with some of these other strategies. And we put it into a workbook and um, we're using it in, in six states around the United States. We have no idea if it is useful. We send it out to anybody that's interested. There's no charge for it. And, my email is there if you're if you'd like to look at the materials and maybe uh, use them for whatever uh, you think they might be useful for. Um, so I think that uh, there there again is my email or I I think we might have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, Mustafa, if um, you see some in the questions, I'd be happy to take a shot for a couple of minutes. Well. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, yeah, this is a well-rounded presentation on the topic, and I see many, many comments and in the comment field and questions and answers. I don't know if you can see the question, the Q and A things that you could maybe talk about. If you can tell us a little bit about the effect of stimulant use on mental health disorders, any issues of comorbidity that you've noticed in in the literature and, and the work you've done over the years. Yeah, well, I mean, if you in the United States right now, if you were to look at the uh, the population that is homeless um, with severe uh, chronic and persistent mental illness, you'll see a lot of methamphetamine use in that population. And it's exactly the worst drug for that population to use. Be well, I, sh I not, shouldn't say that. All, you know, you know, it's kill them. So that's that's pretty bad, too. But um, the, the psychosis that occurs, um, I didn't talk about that. There's a, there's a well-established um, reality that individuals who use methamphetamine in particular often become psychotic. I think the best estimates are something in the neighborhood of 70% of individuals who use methamphetamine at some point in their use will become psychotic with auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations. Now, most of those are transitory. They will go away within a matter of hours after the use stops. However, some of the, some individuals appear to develop a, a long-lasting psychosis as a result of their chronic methamphetamine use. And of course, if the person has um, a, a thought disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar illness, and they're using these drugs, it will make them much worse and will. Um, uh, often we see that the, the uh, uh, side effect of the methamphetamine use will be they discontinue their medication and the, the situation gets much worse. Um, you see higher rates among people who have depression, obviously, as they attempt to self-medicate uh, their depression. There's a whole big question that's very unclear about the interaction of stimulant use and attention deficit disorder among adults. Now, a lot, one of the things we're seeing here in Vermont where I live now is people going into a primary care clinics saying, uh, I have attention deficit disorder. I'm a 42 year old man. When I was in high school, I couldn't concentrate. I've had ADHD my whole life and I need some prescription stimulants, Adderall or, or uh, Ritalin. And um, there's some question about do these people actually have an attention deficit disorder or is this drug seeking behavior? And so in, in a lot of cases, you'll see the uh, people in treatment for stimulant use disorder going, well, I always had ADHD and so I'm self-medicating. I don't think we have a real clear picture of 
how much of this is truly ADHD complicated by stimulant use or a stimulant use disorder that looks something like ADHD. I think that it's not all that different than our situation back 20 years ago with prescription opioids and pain. It's like, are, the, are these people really, do they have this disorder or is, it the, is this drug seeking behavior? So it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a huge overlap with mental health issues as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, actually we are past the hour and uh, thank you so much, Rick. And thank uh, you all Mr. for, <laughs> thank you all. Mustafa, for, can thank I collect up, can I, will I be able to get these questions and I'll answer them all? Yes, and, yes, that's, that's, that's a great plan. That that's, I, I'm glad you, you volunteered to do that. That would be really helpful. And I uh, will be in contact uh, with you all. Thank you all for attending. And uh, until next month, uh, stay safe and uh, stay well. And thank you.